Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to this uh, CERC seminar series for today. Um, I would like to remind everyone before we start that uh, during the presentation, if you have questions, please use the, the Q&A uh, button to type in your questions. So I'll be able to uh, read the question to the speakers after the talk. So our first speaker today is Louis Alexandre Fournier from Peter Sterling Lab. So Louis is originally from Quebec City. He obtained his BSc in micro microbiology and immunology from McGill University in 2017. He then joined the Sterling Lab uh, the same year to start his PhD, where he uses CRISPR screening to uncover genetic dependencies of arid one a deficiency in cancers. Um, he hoped to graduate before the end of this year, and uh, he's going to present his research to us today. The title of his talk today is Genome-Wide CRISPR Screen Identifies Vulnerabilities in, in, uh, of ARID1A Deficient Cells. So, Louis, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see my slides? Yes. Awesome. Great. So, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I guess I'll jump right in. So I'm interested in aridone mutations in cancer, which occur in about 7% of all cancers, uh, with frequencies as high as 50% of cases in subtypes like ovarian closed cell carcinoma. And the majority of aridone mutations are missense or frame shift and generally occur throughout the length of the gene and result in loss of protein expression. And so Aridone is the DNA binding subunit of the BAF chromatin remodeling complex, which is part of the Swiss family. Uh, and these complexes function in the regulation of various processes within the cell, uh, including gene expression via uh, either directly remodeling chromatin through nucleosum sliding or by recruiting other factors to the genome. Uh, and as you can see here, Aridone is, is specific to the canonical form of the BAF complex uh, and acts as the DNA binding subunit, like I mentioned. And so, as you might imagine, uh, ARD1A loss in cancer results in the dysregulation of many processes uh, with a general, uh, which I've tried to sort of illustrate here on the slide. And uh, as you can see, uh, we see dysregulated epigenetics with a general decrease in chromatin accessibility in these cells. Other phenotypes include uh, gene expression dysregulation, which is characterized by transcriptional transcriptome rewiring and transcriptional dynamics defects. Uh, our lab has also reported on the genome instability side of things with aridone mutation, where we see increases in DNA replication stress, DNA damage, uh, which can partially be explained by an accumulation of R loops. It's also worth mentioning that uh, some of these phenotypes occur despite the fact that uh, ARD1B, which is a paralog of ARD1A, can partially rescue some of these functions within the complex when ARD1A is lost, uh, but obviously not completely because we, we see all of these phenotypes. And although the study of ARD1A mutation in specific cellular contexts has allowed to identify vulnerabilities of ARD1A deficient cancer cells, uh, some of which I've tried to illustrate in these uh, red boxes, there really hasn't been any major breakthroughs in the clinic for the treatment of these cancers. And so ultimately, there remains a need to identify new ways of selectively killing these ARDNA deficient cancer cells. So this is what my project aims to address by identifying synthetic lethal partners of ARDNA using a genome-wide CRISPR screening approach. And so as you've probably heard, synthetic lethality is this concept where a combination of genetic deficiencies leads to a lethal phenotype, whereas a single deficiency does not. And so uh, in other words, if we know that cancer cells are selecting for the loss of ARID1A, uh, if we're able to identify synthetic lethal partners in the form of gene B here, for instance, that we could target with a drug, we could selectively kill these cancer cells. So to do this at the genome-wide scale, I've employed the Toronto Knockout version three library, which is a CRISPR library that targets over 18,000 genes in human cells. Uh, I've packaged this library into lentiviral particles, uh, which I've used to infect RNA wild type or knockout cells uh, at a ratio so that only one guide RNA should be incorporated per cell. And so the infected cells are then selected with pure mycin for, uh, for infection. And, and an initial time point is collecting 
collected at the start of the experiment to assess the representation of our library. Uh, we can then outgrow the cells for a period of 14 days uh, to allow for fitness defects to develop, uh, which are associated with these different guide RNAs. And using amplicon sequencing and the BAGEL2 algorithm for analysis, we can compare the guide RNA representation at the start of the experiment versus at the end of these 14 days in our different cell populations. And so if a guide RNA causes a fitness defect, we expect this guide RNA to drop out over time as the cells die. And so you can imagine that if a guide RNA drops out in both the RNA wild type and knockout cells, as illustrated here, this would probably correspond to an essential gene. Whereas a guide RNA that uh, drops out specifically in these RNA deficient cells suggests that these are perhaps synthetic lethal partners of RNA, and those are really the guides or, or the gene knockouts that we're interested in. So we performed this CRISPR screening approach in biological duplicates in an ovarian clear cell carcinoma uh, isogenic cell line model of ARDNA. And we first uh, looked at the precision recall curve and library representation as sort of a quality control metric uh, to assess the performance of our screen. And we found that our experiment captured over 99% of the gut RNAs in our library. And uh, the high precision to recall ratio, which you see here plotted, uh, suggested that the algorithm was able to identify a low false positive and a low false negative rates based on the training data set that it uses to output fitness scores. If we overlap the list of hits between our two replicates, uh, so these are the, the genes that are specifically, uh, the genes that we associate the synthetic lethality to ARDNA in either replicates, if we overlap these hits, we see a consensus of 103 genes, uh, one of which includes KEEP1, and that's what I'll talk about. Uh, more later on. Uh, if we do a gene ontology analysis of this consensus data set of 103 genes, unfortunately, we don't obtain uh, any statistically significant uh, pathways that are enriched. However, when we use the totality of these genes between both replicates, we find processes relating to gene expression, mitosis, splicing, mitochondrial processes as being enriched, which is in agreement with the literature about ARDNA loss in cancer. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that we did recover known synthetic lethal partners of ARDNA among this list. Um, if we look at these consensus hits that I was talking about and average the fitness scores between the two replicates, the top three hits from our screen are PNPO, CTDSP1, and KEEP1. And KEEP1 is the one I want to focus on today uh, as one of the targets that we decided to follow up on. So KEEP1 is uh, part of a E3 ubiquitin ligase complex along with CULP3 and RBX1. And KEEP1 regulates a variety of processes within the cell. And this includes uh, proteostasis, cell cycle, and more. And one of the most studied functions of KEEP1 is its role in repressing this transcription factor called NRF2. Um, so under normal conditions, KEEP1 uh, binds NRF2 and targets it for proteasomal degradation. However, under conditions of oxidative stress, uh, reactive oxygen species can oxidize certain residues on KEEP1, which triggers the release of this inhibition and NRF2 can then translocate into the nucleus and activate the transcription of hundreds of genes. So the first thing we set out to do was to actually validate if aerodynamic deficient cells are sensitive to KEEP1 depletion. So the first thing I did was to knock down KEEP1 with sRNAs in our isogenic RMG1 cell line pair that we use to screen. Uh, and so as you can see, if we uh, knock down KEEP1 with two different sRNAs, we see a general upregulation of NRF2, which is uh, expected in these conditions. And uh, we see that ARDNA deficient cells here in red are sensitive to this depletion. To complement this data, I also generated an ARDNA knockout clone uh, in RPE1 cells, so another isogenic model to test uh, using CRISPR. And we observed similar phenotypes in the cell line where ARDNA knockout cells are sensitive to this uh, depletion of KEEP1. In addition to the RNAi data that I've generated, I also use a small molecule inhibitor of KEEP1 called AI1. Uh, and as you can see from this incusite data, uh, ARDNA knockout cell growth is impaired by AI1 inhibition in our RMG model, as well as our RPE model. Uh, and so this to us confirmed that the, the synthetic lethal relationship we identified from our screen was uh, could validate in these cell line models. 
And in the interest of time today, I can't present uh, more data on this, but we have uh, data from other inhibitors as well, where we see sensitivity of some of our uh, arabinine deficient clones. So the next thing I wanted to do was to look at what happens to these aerodynamic knockout cells when we inhibit HEAP1. And so being a genome instability lab, the first thing I wanted to look at were uh, genome instability markers. And so I, I uh, used this AI1 inhibitor for which I just showed sensitivity and treated aerodynamic uh, wild type and knockout cells uh, with this inhibitor. And so for all of these figures, uh, you can see the aerodynamic wild type cells and aerodynamic knockout cells in untreated condition, followed by uh, the wild type cells and knockout cells treated with AI1. And uh, overall, what I found is that AI1 causes more DNA replication stress measured by fossil RPA, uh, as well as DNA damage, uh, again, which is uh, measured by gamma H2X foci formation. Uh, and this also correlated with uh, micro micronuclei formation. Uh, which suggests that perhaps these, uh, this damage is persisting in these aerodynamic knockout cells, uh, and uh, they're perhaps also experiencing some topological stress. Uh, so at the moment, it remains unclear what is at the root of these phenotypes, but we're working on a few hypotheses to better understand the mechanism that might be at play here. And so in the interest of time, I'll conclude my talk here, but overall I've uncovered a new genetic dependency of airway knockout cells in KEEP1. Uh, I've also shown that inhibition of KEEP1 exacerbates genome instability phenotypes in airway knockout cells specifically. And the main remaining question right now is regarding the mechanisms of synthetic, synthetic lethality between KEEP1 and airway. Uh, we have, like I said, we have a few hypotheses at the moment. Uh, we think that maybe it's because of transcriptional dysregulation through NRF2. Uh, so it's possible that imbalanced levels of NRF2 are also associated with changes in metabolism uh, or can even lead to reductive stress, which could be causing this synthetic lethal relationship. It's also possible that topological stress is at play, and this would agree with our genome instability findings. Um, there's evidence in the field suggesting that cells depleted for KEEP1 have lower top 2A protein levels, and this is independent of the NRF2 function. Uh, we also... Uh, reported previously that aerodynamic knockout cells have top three localization defects, and so perhaps this combination is, is lethal in these cells. Uh, we also think that it's possible that there's a general dysregulation of proteostasis uh, by inhibiting KEEP1, and this uh, and KEEP1 regulates the degradation of various proteins also involved in autophagy, so it's possible that these pathways being dysregulated uh, are toxic. And um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped on this project, our funding agencies, and uh, my supervisor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, Thank you. We, have, we have one question in the Q&A um, section. So please, everyone, right. if you have questions, uh, write down your uh, question in the Q&A. So I'm going to go with the first question uh, from uh, Magda Shadar Skera. Uh, did you see ARID1B, a known synthetic lethal partner for ARID1A, in your top hit list? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so ARID1B didn't make the consensus uh, overlap, but it was recovered in one of the two replicates. Um, and we did see other... Uh, SMARC subunits, for instance, SMARC C1 and SMARC E1, I believe, uh, as part of the consensus. So we, we do recover some known uh, ARID1A synthetic lethal partners. Uh, unfortunately, ARID1B just didn't meet the cutoff uh, for both replicates. Okay, I see. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Indu Patwal. How are, how are you going to test toxicity in terms of metabolism? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm currently trying to wrap up. So this perhaps might be for someone else to take over uh, after I'm done. Um, we have talked to some collaborators on this. We're, we're not very well versed in metabolism in our lab. So this is still a bit of a black box to me. Um, what I've been interested in regarding metabolism is the idea that reductive stress might be toxic in these cells. And so looking at NADH levels uh, with NAD is one way of testing for that. So that's about the extent of the 
of what I would like to test maybe uh, mm -hmm. for this, but there's obviously a lot of at play with metabolism. So that's probably more complex yeah. uh, than just that. I had just to follow up on this. I had a quick question on the, on that uh, aspect. Did you observe any other metabolic uh, targets in your uh, list and some of them that could be related to oxidative stress uh, mitigation? Yeah, perhaps. Uh, one off the top of my head, the only one that comes to mind is uh, ENO1. Um, actually, PNPO, which was the top hit, is uh, relates to the meta metabolism of vitamin B6. Uh, so that's something that would perhaps be interesting to test if that pathway um, is somehow um, affected in these aerodynamic deficient cells. But it's not something that we've looked excessively at at the moment. Okay, that's good. Um, next question mm -hmm. by Manalis Papamichos. Uh, you mentioned R loops as targets of ARID1A. Does overexpression of RNAs H1 rescue the synthetic lethality? So that's a good question. So I act, we actually haven't looked at R loops under uh, KEEP1 um, inhibition. Uh, so we've documented in the past that um, ARID1A deficient cells accumulate more R loops, and that perhaps might be the case based on the genome instability phenotypes that we see in our KEEP1 inhibited cells. Um, but we haven't tested um, this specifically, where where overexpressing RNAs H1 might might rescue the synthetic valley. But it's something that that is interesting and um, could be easily tested. Okay. <clears throat> uh, next question by Steve Bilodeau: Are the knockout mm -hmm. cells more sensitive to hypoxia? So there's evidence in the field that aerodynamic deficient cells are vulnerable to uh, induction of ROS, which is a bit, um, which renders our data a little bit um, confusing. Um, in my view, after taking a crash course in this field uh, over the past few months, um, I think the the right balance of ROS is very important for these cells. We've tested um, the levels of reactive oxygen species in these cells uh, using um, a fluorescent reagent, and we didn't see major differences uh, in our isogenic pair. Um, so it's possible that um, some aerodynamic deficient cells select for higher levels of ROS, but it, at least in our models at the moment, it doesn't seem like it. Um, so that's perhaps something that could be tested, uh, but that we haven't uh, expanded on. I'm going to take the last two questions quickly. Have you looked at mm -hmm. the KEEP1A in the DEPMAP project? Yes. So I've looked at DEPMAP data uh, to try to uh, correlate our screen data. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't a huge overlap between KEEP1 dependencies and our hit list, at least the consensus uh, of 103 genes. Uh, there were certain if I look at the keep one interactome uh, and overlap that to our list, then there's a few hits that come out. Uh, for example, one of, a, one of the hits from our screen that was a little bit further down the list is uh, NBR1, which is involved in autophagy um, and is part of the keep one interactome. So perhaps that this uh, proteostasis angle is more, um, is, is involved in the synthetic lethality. And that's something we're looking at testing. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And one mm -hmm. last question. Um, it's interesting that ARID1B can't rescue the loss of ARID1A. I was wondering if you think it's simply a matter of combined ARID1AB dosage, or if ARID1A has a specific protein function versus ARID1B. So in terms of viability, I think that most people have shown that ARID1B can rescue the loss of ARID1A. And there's a paper that comes to mind that um, showed that losing ARID1A caused uh, significant transcription di uh, transcriptional dynamic defects, but that after a week of, uh, of this knockout, ARID1B could come in and rescue most loci, except for a subset uh, of genes. Um, so in the context of uh, sorry, I'm just rereading the question here. Uh, so to me, that suggests that perhaps there are specific functions of ARID1A that can't be rescued by, by ARID1B. 
And I think that's generally accepted. Uh, whether that is ex exclusively through the complex or um, sort of as a, a scaffold protein remains to be um, sort of elucidated. But um, yeah, I think that's the general gist. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Louis Alexandre. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to go to our next uh, speaker. Um, for the people who uh, type down questions, you can ask the question at the end of the conference, or the speaker can have access to them also and uh, and reply. So our next um, speaker today is uh, Dr. Peter Serling. Dr. Sterling um, is a senior scientist at the BC Cancer Research Institute in Vancouver and is an associate professor at the Department of Medical Genetics at UBC. Uh, yeah, UBC. His lab studies the causes and consequences of genome instability, uh, including functional studies of genome maintenance factors, analysis of mutation signatures, chromatin modifiers and genome integrity and protein quality control in response to genotoxins. They, um, they uh, hope to translate these findings to novel anti-cancer intervention that can exploit tumor genome instability for therapy, in particular by exploiting synthetic lethal or synthetic dosage interaction using yeast and human systems. So the title of his talk today is Structure Function Analysis of H2AZ and its role in uh, transcription. So Dr. Sterling, you can go ahead, please. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, the title's slightly different here. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Good job, Louis. Um, it was uh, nice to see your talk to this big audience. and. I think you guys are in for a very, very different kind of talk. It's kind of fun. We're in the same lab, but there's a lot of um, diversity in projects. And so today I'll be talking about a project that I've never actually talked about before that emerged from a uh, really nice long-term collaboration that I've had with Mike Kobor and uh, I'll highlight his student Hillary here in a few minutes. So um, I, I guess just by way of an introduction, as you said, uh, jean Geneviève, we are, um, you know, my lab is interested in sources of genome instability. So what are the mechanisms at play in cells that give rise to mutagenesis, give rise to chromosome instability, and ultimately how do those processes fuel cancer development? And one of the types of stress that we're interested in is endogenous sources of stress. So what's happening in normal cells all the time that when perturbed slightly could lead to stress that leads to mutation. And one of those endogenous sources of stress is transcription. So it's been known for a long time that transcription and replication, as you guys know, occur on the same template molecule and therefore have the potential to interfere with one another. And so I took this figure uh, from an old review from the lab, just sort of illustrating that um, transcription replication conflicts happen and activation of oncogenes and their associated uh, perturbation of replication timing or perturbation of the transcriptome have sh been shown to lead to increases in these conflicts. And similarly, loss of tumor suppressor genes like uh, BRCA proteins that can protect replication forks have also been shown to mitigate these conflicts. Um, I picked this cartoon uh, for it's kind of bad and colorful. This is like before we started using BioRender, um, but there's a big black box missing from this conflict and that's chromatin, right? We know uh, that these conflicts are taking place in the context of chromatin and that there's a number of you know, studies now showing that histone variants histone post-translational modifications uh, and other sort of changes in chromatin state at these conflicts regulate their uh, formation and dissolution. And so we've become more interested in that over the last few years. And Louis alluded to a story we published early, early in the pandemic, I like to say, on ARID1A uh, regulating r loop associated DNA replication stress. And you heard about Louis' Louis talk. So this was a, a slide that was in here, but when I thought I was going first. So <laughs> we'll dispense with that uh, and, and say, you know, really the talk I want to give you today relates to this idea that we, we want to understand more about chromatin state histone variants in particular and how they regulate cellular responses to DNA replication stress in the hopes of eventually learning more about how endogenous stresses like that from transcription can lead to these, uh, can interplay with, with the epigenome. And so this project came out of a collaboration with Mike Kobor, as I mentioned, and I'm highlighting Hilary Bruis here uh, at the outset because she did all the work that I'm gonna show you today uh, and has really established a beautiful 
system for structure function analyses of histone variants using yeast as a simple model. And I'll talk a little bit about that first and then come back to a sort of newer unpublished story containing preliminary data that uh, really tries to get further down the road towards understanding the role of this histone variant in the response to DNA replication stress. Um, so as this audience well knows, histone variants are um, paralog or orthologs of the canonical histones, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, um, that have various cellular functions. They're typically transcribed and deposited throughout the cell cycle, so they're not replication dependent like canonical histone octomers. They're only found at specific genomic loci, which presumably relates to their function, uh, and they have changes in protein sequence and structure that alter nucleosomes, right? So they alter nucleosome stability, positioning, interactions, uh, and so they're quite important for, you know, the epigenetic code. There are many histone variants, in particular in, in mammalian cells. There are, you know, multiple H2A variants, multiple H3A variants, and a few H2B variants. Um, but yeast has done a very, uh, I guess, good job of simplifying the histone mm -hmm. variant code for us and creating a, a really nice model system to interrogate this. So budding yeast has two histone variants, uh, SEMP-A, uh, ortholog CSC4 uh, that occupies the centromeric histone, and then H2AZ. So H2AZ is really the histone variant that's the most widely conserved across evolution from yeast to humans. And as you guys may know, yeast create a really simple model system where we can make genetic perturbations very easily and in, a, in this sort of simple system study this function of this one histone variant that's conserved. Um, so H2AZ uh, is the histone variant that's conserved and it has many um, functions throughout the last few decades of research. So it's been implicated uh, in the yeast and other systems in defining heterochromatin boundaries in DNA repair and, and various other DNA transactions, replication and transplicing, um, as well as developmental processes at the cellular and organismal level like epithelial to mesenchymal transition or even memory in, in this mouse model here. What we think, and I'll tell you why, is that a lot of these phenotypes, a lot of these connections may be linked to H2AZ's role in transcription regulation. And so we think that if we can understand a bit more about its role in transcription regulation, that we're going to be able to um, understand how it impacts some of these other processes as well. One of the reasons that we think that the transcriptional regulatory um, uh, role of H2AZ is going to be so important is, is its positioning. So in yeast, H2AZ is present at the promoter at the plus one nucleosome of about two thirds of genes, so 63% of genes. Uh, as well as, as to a, a lesser area, so the lesser extent at the minus one nucleosome. And I think it's debatable whether that's just divergent genes or, or has a function there. This enrichment is mediated by an HP dependent chromatin remodeler called the SWOR complex, SWOR1 complex, that was discovered first in yeast and now is, is known to be conserved across species as well. Um, so on the bottom here are some chip qPCR experiments just showing that a whole bunch of genes uh, that there is H2AZ enrichment at the promoter. Um, and that if we delete SWOR1, that enrichment is completely mm -hmm. gone. So H2AZ actually does not, um, does not go into chromatin when SWOR1 is deleted. And that'll become important later. So um, what's it doing there, I think is the question. And there's a couple of observations I wanted to share with you guys. So this is uh, a, a chip, chip or chip, chip seek experiment showing H2AZ occupancy across transcriptional start sites. So centered at the transcriptional start site. And there's a couple of things to notice. So very, very highly transcribed genes. There's no enrichment. They probably don't have a plus one nucleosome because transcription is mm -hmm. happening so, so rapidly at these genes. Um, however, at the rest of genes, so these two thirds of other mm -hmm. genes, the H2AZ occupancy is spread across different transcriptional uh, frequencies. So really there's no linear correlation between H2AZ occupancy and transcription frequency. So highly transcribed genes as well as lesser transcribed genes all have this enrichment. And so it's been kind of thought that, you know, maybe H2AZ by creating this variant nucleosome at that position somehow creates an environment that favors um, RNA polymerase overcoming that initiation barrier to enter productive elongation and that plus one nucleosome mm -hmm. having H2AZ is just important. So it's not necessarily driving transcription, but it's enabling an environment where other signals can promote various levels of transcription. I think, you know, 
perhaps inconsistent with that, when you knock out H2AZ, only 5% of genes, and, and Hillary's refined this a bit, um, are really differentially expressed. So cells either adapt or don't care whether H2AZ is at their plus one nucleosome. However, they do care if H2AZ is deleted. So these are uh, yeast spot dilution assays showing uh, uh, various growth phenotypes in the presence of stresses mostly genome targeting stresses. So what, what you're looking at here is a, a yeast culture that's been serially diluted from left to right. And you can see on uh, stress, con stress containing media that the cells don't grow as well. So if you delete H2AZ, and I'll highlight this second column here, hydroxyurea, um, you get a pretty significant growth phenotype. You also get a growth phenotype if you delete SWER1, but it's not as bad. And this is something interesting that we'll dive into a little bit later. Um, but hydroxyurea is a small molecule inhibitor of ribonucleotide reductase, which is a critical enzyme in uh, making DNTPs. And so if you inhibit ribonucleotide reductase, you starve the cell of deoxyribonucleotides and thus stall DNA replication. So HU treatment ultimately delays DNA replication, stalled replication force, trigger uh, a DNA damage response. And ultimately this is also associated with a rapid change in the transcriptome to try to deal with this stress. So we think this is a great system to study um, a, uh, H2AZ uh, uh, phenotypes in the re response to replication stress. I'm actually gonna come back to that because the first thing that Hillary did and when we really started collaborating as her, I'm her co-supervisor along with Mike, um, she had set up this beautiful system to study really at a structure function level, what are the important biochemical features of H2AZ that differentiate it from H2A? So we can see here that same uh, sort of phenotypic spot assay on the top and H2AZ deletions are very sensitive. You can completely complement that by expressing H2AZ from a promoter. And of course you cannot complement it at all when you express H2A from the same promoter on this plasma. So something about the sequence is, is differentiating too. And Hillary could use this system to, to tease that apart. And the way she did that was by producing a large set of chimeric constructs. So there are nine regions of the histones, H2A and H2AZ, that are, that are differentiable. So the N and C termini differ, there's those tails that are most post nucleosomally modified. And then within the protein, there are these three, um, these four group regions, these loop regions, L1 and L2, and this M6 region that I'll talk about. And so what she did is created plasmids with H2AZ um, that she has replaced with the relevant group of H2A, and then conversely, H2A constructs that she's been making chimeras up with these H2AZ regions. So by testing all of these, she should be able to zero in on which regions of the protein are actually important to confer H2AZ identity and function. So this is sort of an initial look at those groups in the, in the spot essays, and I wanna draw your attention to a couple of things. So one is when you just replace one region at a time, what we see is that it's really this M6 region that's important for, to confer a little bit of growth advantage. So if you look at the highlighted uh, group here, if we express H2A on the left with just the M6 region of H2AZ, we get a little bit of rescue and growth. And this is actually based on a published observation that the M6 region is what's important for H2AZ to interact with the SWER complex and actually be deposited into chromatin. So interaction with SWER is really important and, and you know, she can show the opposite experiment by deleting that region or replacing that region of H2AZ with that region from H2A, we see a growth defect. So she decided to redo all the chimera experiments in the background of a variant that had this M6 region. So when she does that, things start to get more interesting and I'll spare you going through all these and just jump to the conclusion that if you now have an H2A containing construct that has the H2AZ M6 region that binds swear one and this group four amino acid region, you completely rescue the growth phenotype. So compare the H2AZ wild type rescue construct here, full growth on hydroxyurea here on the right, uh, to the chimera that just is H2A, but with the M6 and the group four region. And, and you also, again, see complete rescue. So this is somewhat remarkable. You confer the ability of H2A to interact with SWER1, and then you mutate two more amino acids, uh, this arginine and uh, asparagine to a lysine and a leucine at the group four region. So it's really just two changes. And Hillary did some subsequent work to, so, to show it's really just the leucine. It's really leucine 82 that's conferring most of this phenotype. 
So these are highly conserved residues across species and obviously are really important for conferring this H2AZ identity. Um, so by having M6 and group four together in an otherwise H2A backbone, you completely rescue growth phenotypes. So the ability of H2AZ, to, the cells to respond to stress is restored somehow. However, there are some phenotypes that are not restored. And this is where I think Hillary's work really gets interesting and creates some provocative um, questions. So what I'm showing here is just chip qPCR experiments with uh, two candidate or two genes known to have H2AZ enrichment that they're promoter, Git1 and RDS1. And what I hope you can see in gray is the promoter primers and in white are primers within the open reading frame of the, of the genes. And you can see that H2AZ is enriched at the promoter. So there's a significant enrichment of H2AZ at the promoter and there's less in, in the gene body. Um, that's not the case for H2A where you know, it's basically present in all of the uh, regions of the genome. So now let's try these experiments again with these chimeras to see whether they can rescue the positioning of H2AZ. So the M6 region, uh, as we saw, had a very modest effect on rescuing the growth of cells lacking H2AZ. So when you express the M6 containing chimera, there's really no restoration of positioning. The, the, the chimera is incorporated into chromatin at all positions, at the promoter and in the operating frame. And even when you include the group four mutations that I'm showing here on the bottom completely rescued the cellular response to stress, we don't see enrichment or you know, specific positioning of the chimera at the promoter. And so um, you know, I'll, I, I was quite excited by this result because it really for the first time creates an allele that separates the function of H2AZ in, in cellular fitness from its positioning, at least its enriched positioning at promoters. Hillary went on to show even um, the group four plus the C-terminus. So now including that C-terminal tail that gets postnatally modified, it's trending towards promoter enrichment, but we really don't see a significant promoter enrichment of this chimera either compared to the wild type. So the question became, is it functional for transcriptional regulation? And um, what you can see here on the bottom is GIT1, one of these target genes that, you know, this C-terminal, uh, this three, this triple chimera in purple rescues GIT1 expression, even though it doesn't necessarily rescue promoter enrichment. And I think that's better illustrated when Hillary went to look at an inducible gene uh, in the galactose operon, so, or in the galactose pathway. So um, in yeast, when you switch the carbon source from glucose to galactose, there is an induction of these special genes, including the GAL1 message here uh, in, this, in this qPCR experiment, or this mRNA, um, sorry, RT-PCR experiment. So she's looking at GAL1 induction. And uh, what you can see over a couple hours in galactose is the wild type in red, the H2AZ, when it's there, you get rapid induction and you get this lag when you have these mutations. Now in blue and purple are the group four and the group four plus C-terminal chimeras. And what I hope you can see is that especially at later time points, they significantly rescue the induction of GAL1, even though positioning at the plus one nucleosome was lost. So, I think what, um, what this work has done and, and what sort of Hillary has shown here is that you can separate the function of H2AZ as a plus one nucleosome enriched histone variant from its ability to restore growth in the presence of various types of stress, from its ability to restore transcription induction. And so we think there's a lot more to learn about um, the, the relationship between nucleosome or H2AZ variant nucleosome positioning and its role in transcription regulation. So I guess the other take-home messages were as few as nine amino acids completely rescue um, <clears throat> the ability of H2A with nine amino acid changes to rescue a, a cell lacking H2A set. So there's a really subtle uh, difference between these two, um, the, the variant and the canonical histone. And these are in these three regions that I've defined here, or we've defined at the bottom. Uh, and then as I said, the H2AZ functionally um, is really separate from its chromatin occupancy pattern. So it needs to get into chromatin uh, perhaps you know, everywhere, but it, that specific enrichment at every plus one nucleosome is not, not important, not as important as we thought. Okay, <clears throat> so that actually is published and I'll move to sort of talk about uh, kind of what's been happening more lately on this project. And this is an unpublished and ongoing 
uh, sort of more omics approach that Hillary has taken subsequent to that, that project. So I guess the reasoning behind going in this direction was we know that at a steady state in otherwise normal conditions, H2AZ knockouts don't have a strong phenotype. It's really only in stress conditions where you know, you've added some endogenous stress and you know, what we assume is that a, a transcriptional response to that stress needs to be mounted and uh, you know, H2AZ is important for that. So maybe we need to be studying H2AZ positioning, gene expression regulation and, and promoter enrichment in the context of stress. Obviously working with my lab, the stress of choice had to be replication stress. And so uh, I'll, I'll describe a little bit what experiments Hillary set up here. So she really set about to, to make two experiments under stress conditions, uh, an RNA-seq experiment to measure gene expression changes in various genetic backgrounds, and a MNAs chip seq experiment to map H2AZ variant nucleosome positioning under stress. Okay, so the RNA-seq uh, experimental design is, is like this. Uh, I think very cleverly Hillary elected to do both wild type and H2AZ knockouts, but also SWIR1 knockouts and double knockouts. And I'll just point you again to the phenotype uh, in hydroxyurea over here on the right that, you know, H2AZ knockouts are really worse or more sensitive than SWIR1 knockouts to hydroxyurea. Uh, and this is a bit puzzling because in all of these backgrounds in H2AZ as well as the SWIR1 deletions, there's no H2AZ in chromatin, uh, particularly the double mutant. There's no H2AZ around, but the cells are healthier than if you have H2AZ alone. And so we'll talk a little bit about insights there. Uh, so we have the four strains, untreated, HU treated, and she did six biological replicates for each one. So this is a really uh, deep uh, data set for us to, and, and you know, um, robust data set to, to look at gene expression in these backgrounds. I think, you know, as a HU treatment of yeast cells has been done many times uh, and looked at the gene expression. And so first step in this kind of analysis is just a sanity check to say, do we see what other people saw? And one of the things that happens in hydroxyurea treatment is that very highly expressed, you know, energy uh, uh, demand, high energy demand genes like ribosome production genes, ribosomal protein genes, those are repressed. And we saw that. So there were 471 genes repressed in HU, just in wild type cells. And they tend to be things like ribosome production. And conversely, there's a stress response. So DNA damage response, the environmental stress response, those genes that have been previously known, they go up. Uh, and we saw that as well. So the data looks good. It's tracking with what uh, is happening in the literature. Um, this is a, a principal component analysis looking at all the RNA-seq data sets, the 48 RNA-seq data sets together. And what I hope you can see is, you know, unsurprisingly, the, the largest contributor to variance between the data sets is HU treatment. So on the left here are all the samples. I can't point at my screen. On the, on the left here are, all the samples where uh, there's untreated and on the right is all the samples treated with hydroxyurea. Now, uh, what's interesting is, so the other you know, main way that variance is explained is unsurprisingly the genotype, right? So all the wild type samples cluster together and then the H2AZ samples in pink here cluster together on the top. Um, interestingly, the SWIR1 and the H2AZ SWIR1 data sets also cluster all together. Um, and I, I showed you before, and I mentioned twice now, that loss of SWIR1, um, it's a little HU sensitive, but it partially suppresses the sensitivity of H2AZ knockouts. And so we think what's happening here and why, so remember what's happening. In all of the mutant strains, there's no H2AZ in chromatin. And yet you see this different clustering of the H2AZ single mutants versus the SWIR1 deletions. And so what's happening is the SWIR1 complex without its substrate, without the H2A1 variant is causing problems, creating a, a more toxicity, as you can see in the HU, and ultimately probably interfering with gene expression based on the RNA-seq. Mm -hmm. And so we think that this list, um, we think that this list of genes, this change in gene expression can actually tell us a little bit about SWIR, SWIR complex mischief, if you will. So what is actually going wrong? Is the SWIR1 complex creating a stress response? Is it binding the genome and regulating the, uh, the substrates, uh, the expression of a few genes without H2AZ? We think that this data set can tell us a bit about that. And I'm really excited to explore that. Um, I don't know the answer for you yet. So it's preliminary, but I, I think that just the PCA analysis, the phenotypes uh, is, is telling us that we can learn about this SWIR1 mischief through this project. Okay, that's an aside because we're still learning about that. So the other thing uh, to point out is that, you know, I talked about Mark Meneghini's paper showing that H2AZ 
leads to gene expression changes, a loss leads to gene expression changes in 5% of genes. So Hillary's data refines that somewhat, and it's actually closer to two to 3%. So in untreated cells, if you just compare wild type and H2AZ knockouts, um, there's 147 genes that are called as differentially expressed genes, either up or down regulated. Uh, so it's pretty modest given the fact that this histone variant is at two thirds of gene promoters. And that kind of aligns with the sort of um, surprise that we had earlier about the disconnect between transcription uh, regulation and positioning. But anyway, so, uh, and, and then I guess the other thing to say at the untreated conditions is that loss of SWER1 further affects about 40 genes. So that's where I think we can learn about SWER1 mischief and I'm hoping additional analyses will tell us more about that. Okay, but the hypothesis remember was Okay, we've got the gene expression. We, you know, maybe we've done it. Maybe it's a better data set than what's out there, but it's still kind of known stuff. There's a small change in the genome when you with uh, H2AZ. Uh, HU induces this big stress response. That all lines up. So, what happens to H2AZ occupancy and positioning when we're under this stress condition? So, Hillary generated this MNAs uh, chip seek, a native MNAs chip seek experiment using uh, H2AZ flag uh, alleles and as a control head on H2AZ knockout, as well as a SWER1 knockout. So again here, this what I'm not showing you is this proved that H2AZ is just not getting into chromatin when you don't have SWER1, uh, consistent with what we've known for 20 years. Okay, so we generate this data set, uh, three biological replicates, and you know, high level, it looks good. It looks like what's published. So um, even under hydroxyurea conditions, we see this strong plus one nucleosome positioning of H2AZ in the ChIP-seq experiments. Um, and that's, you know, also, it's really just the pattern that I showed you earlier. You can't see much of a difference at the heat map level on the left with hydroxyurea, but on the right, I'll just show an example of uh, some of the stats here. So there are changes in H2AZ occupancy following hydroxyurea. 667 genes have a, a loss of H2AZ occupancy, 390 genes, uh, sorry, 277 genes have an increase in H2AZ occupancy. 390 genes have a decrease in H2AZ occupancy. And one of the examples that's really striking here on the bottom is an example of an H2A, uh, sorry, an HU inducible gene. So in the response to HU, ribonucleotide reductase, the, the target of HU is strongly induced. And so uh, it's on the Crick strand here. Uh, don't mind the reads piling up down here, but you can see that RNR3 is dramatically induced in the HU condition on the bottom. This is the mRNA. And on the top, you can see H2AZ occupancy. So Basically, there's a bunch of H2AZ kind of in the in the five prime of the gene here, and that's dramatically dampened and, and reduced when um, you have hydroxyurea treatment. Now, I think what's happening here, and I think you probably do too, is that you're just ramping up expression of this gene, turning over histones, clearing them out, and H2AZ is just not being replaced in you know at that uh, high transcription frequency. So that could be an explanation where H2AZ removal is more of a consequence than a cause of a change in gene expression. Okay, so I'm just looking at the time here. Um, so when exposed to hydroxyurea, now we can compare untreated versus HU treated for all the different genotypes and ask questions about H2AZ occupancy. So there is a, a, a muted response when you delete H2AZ. So going from 1,156 genes that are changed in wild type down to about 900 that are changed in H2AZ. So there's a big difference in the response. But a lot of that is actually rescued when you delete SWER1. So again, even in HU, or especially in HU, that SWER1 complex being there is changing the response. So we think we really need to be looking at these uh, uh, from the perspective of um, separating. So in all the samples on the right, yeah, in all the samples on the right, all the mutants, there's no H2AZ in chromatin. And so that is where we think um, the function of H2AZ in responding to HU is gonna be seen. So the difference between wild type and all the mutants is a relevant comparator. And then when we're looking at square one mischief, we should be looking at H2AZ versus the double mutant. And that, that's what we're doing. But if you just say, what are all the differentially expressed genes in wild type that are never differentially expressed in any of the mutants? Maybe that's the answer to hydroxyurea sensitivity in these mutants. Um, so there's 86 genes that do this. Uh, there's, so there are 86 genes that are differentially expressed in wild type, but none of the mutants. Um, and our hypothesis, remember, is that, well, it's H2AZ occupancy dynamics that's going to be important for some of these changes. Um, but there's actually only six genes that show defects in H2AZ occupancy in response to HU, or not defects, changes 
in H phase that occupancy and response to HU among these 86 differentially expressed genes. And in fact, and Hillary's you know, been cautioning me not to get too excited about this, for five of those six genes, there are really low magnitude changes. Uh, they're statistically significant, but we're not sure of the biological significance. So now we're down to one gene <laughs> that has uh, a change in H2A's at occupancy. So um, basically it's got strong H2A's at loss and the gene is repressed. So kind of the opposite of RNR3, um, but that gene's not repressed in H2A's. So here you know, is where H2A's at remodeling could actually affect gene expression. Um, I'm not holding out hope that one gene uh, is, is the answer here. And I think what the answer may really be is that um, H2AZ occupancy changes are a consequence of changes to gene expression programs, not a cause of a change to gene expression program. So we're, we're still working on that and I, we can talk about it. So the conclusions so far, are, I think, are that this deep matched MNAs and RNA-seq data set is a, is a resource, uh, certainly for us to explore lots of questions about square one mischief, about HU response. It's, it's really a, a deep, beautiful, well-curated and well-controlled data set. So good job, Hillary even if the results are uh, a little bit uh, confusing so far, or at least they refute our hypothesis, which is good sometimes. Okay, so what the, what the data set does is it really refines the baseline of H2A's that effects on gene expression. So we've gone from 5% maybe to 2.5% of genes actually affected, and we wanna understand why that's the case. It's defining how SWER1 loss by having those matched knockout strains with SWER1. It's gonna define how SWER1 complex rewires the genome with and without H its H2AZ substrate there. So we can ask questions about that of the data. Um, and then it's gonna, you know, what we found is that H2, HU exposure, so replication stress, it does alter H2AZ occupancy, but the best examples are, are where the genes are highly induced like RNR3, some of the best examples. So we think that, you know, the gene induction is happening um, uh, uh, because of other regulatory steps and the reduced HUAZ is just a consequence of that, not a cause of that. So that's interesting, even though it refutes our, our idea. Um, and the changes in HUAZ enrichment out of gene don't appear to correlate with changes in that gene's expression. So there's not a big overlap between the changed occupancy and the changed RNA, but we're trying to understand that. So the, the you know I guess the question of the day is, why is H2AZ uh, knockout so sensitive hydroxyurea? I think we're gonna get there. Uh, and I think there is an answer in transcription regulation in particular with respect to the role of the SCORE1 complex. Uh, but I think that we'll have to wait for additional analyses and another day. So I will thank Hillary again. You can see she's present in the COBOR lab picture on the top and in, in the half here and my lab picture on the bottom. And she has done literally everything I talked about today. Um, as but with support from members of the Cobor lab and members of my lab. Um, so thank you and I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Peter, for this uh, very, very nice talk. So we have a couple of questions um, in the Q&A already. So I'll go with the first one, Felix Jonas. Jonas, uh, very nice talk. Did you test if the strains are viable when you move them to uh, YPD after 90 minutes of H2 exposure? And did you look where H2AZ is placed with respect to the replication fork? Um, so I would expect that, so I don't think we've explicitly tested recovery in the mutants, but Hydroxyurea is used frequently to generate S phase arrests and release experiments, certainly for wild type. So I would predict that even at that high concentration, the wild type cells would be able to recover and re-enter the cell cycle uh, in HU. I mean, one of the caveats that maybe maybe will come up later, but I'll just address right off the top of this, is that um, hydroxyurea does arrest the cells, and so you're looking at a gene expression, a, a, a gene expression differences from an asynchronous population that's untreated. And probably after 90 minutes, about a, a very quite a synchronous population that's HU treated. So we are, you know, looking for cell cycle expression data sets to try to filter some of that out. Um, regarding the second question, did you look at where H2AZ is placed with respect to replication forks? Um, so H2AZ is not enriched at replication origins. Uh, we have not explicitly looked at forks, and I've actually encouraged Hillary to do this analysis to see whether there's changes in enrichment adjacent to um, earlier active origins. Uh, so that's an analysis that's ongoing. 
Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, next question from Ju Juliana Rosan. Thank you for your presentation. How do you measure the energy barrier that a variant histone has compared to a canonical? Can these energy bar barriers be uh, modified with environmental modification like exposure to HU or is more involved in their synthesis and stability in the cell cycle? Yeah, so the... So we're not measuring the energy barrier here. That's sort of a model to explain biochemical observations that H2AZ containing nucleosomes are um, basically if you do a chromatin binding experiment and wash them out with, you know, uh, higher salt concentrations, they're a little less stable than H2A canonical nucleosomes. So they, they can be removed from DNA more easily, suggesting that the, the interaction is weaker. Um, can the energy, so in, in vivo, can the energy barrier be modified with environmental modifications? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure it can. And I think that would probably be related to different protein interactions as well as, as PTMs. Like so H2AZ obviously is, is um, post translationally modified like H2A. And so um, that could also regulate, you know, that may be the overlying um, uh, mystery of kind of what is explaining this vast differences in transcription rates uh, when you have, you know, probably not all the nucleosomes of the plus one position are equal, even though they all contain H2AZ. So I, I don't want to wave my hands too much, Juliana, but uh, that's my answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Beverly de Sousa, have you explored differential acetylation of H2AZ in this system? We haven't. Um, we, uh, yeah, as a side project, I'll just mention, I've been pushing uh, Hillary to look at um, PTM, so we've, there's a bit of evidence that uh, sumoylation actually of H2AZ is important for the response to DNA damage and maybe some of these, these DNA replication stresses. So we've, we've made some mutants. We definitely have not looked at them in the omics experiments. And um, uh, yeah, so, so I, I guess I'll just say no to that one. Okay. <laughs> A uh, question from Jacques Côté. What about correcting from uh, for nucleosome occupancy and what about uh, stalled replication hotspot in O80? Um, okay, correcting for nucleosome occupancy. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to let Hillary message me. She did correct for nucleosome occupancy. Jack, great question. So I guess that was done uh, in the, in the uh, analysis. Um, what about stalled replication fork hotspots? So yeah, so in the input samples, she, she had that um, control for nucleosome occupancy. It, the analysis of like fragile regions, replication hotspots, uh, we need to do that. We have not looked at the effect of NO80 on, uh, so NO80 has been implicated in unloading H2AZ at uh, difficult to replicate or, or damaged regions. And so um, that's another potential modifier of the response. And um, we, we need to look at that. I mean, like we, you know, in human cells, H2AZ is enriched at, or at some replication origins, but that's not the case in yeast. And so we, the, the uh, connections there are, are less clear. Okay, thank you. Did uh, Alexia Pigeot, did you plan to perform nascent RNA seq in order to discriminate uh, transcriptional effect from a possible effect on RNA stability or processing? Um, we had we had planned that, and Hillary's been playing around with uh, 4TU sequencing and um, using H2AZ depletion using an anchor OA system, which actually works really well. Um, so talk to about, you know, call her up if you want to talk about it, uh, to just really rapidly deplete H2AZ and then look at the effects on nascent translation or transcription. Um, we did not get to the point yet of executing that experiment, um, but definitely a great idea, Alexia. Okay, and one last question uh, from Tom Moss. Any idea of H2AZ at gene boundaries and answers? I mean, I think it's possible that yeast, the 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 I don't, I don't know if Jacques is still listening, but it's possible that the yeast model will fail us a little bit in studying gene looping and enhancers because the organization of this genome is just a bit different than we would see in human cells. But um, yeah, it's definitely something to explore. I am not aware in the yeast system of any evidence that it's enriched at, at, those, at those places. So uh, it may be just a limitation of the model. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Peter, for this uh... A uh, very interesting talk. I would like to thank everyone for attending today. And I'd like to remind you that our next seminar will be uh, from Arnett Salzman in June. Thank you very much.